Okay, here she is for the last time. Um, I'm just going to disassemble it. And what I want to do is uh, go through the setup process um, rather than write out a recipe for that. Uh, there is a video done by Dave from Vinyl Nirvana, who's probably one of the most, or one of the foremost experts on the uh, Thorns turntables. He's got a little bit of a setup video that shows exactly how to set this particular unit up. Um, he relies on a, a balance scale, which you probably won't have. So what I'll do is I'll go the extra step and explain how to actually balance it using the uh, calibrated scale that's on the back of the. Uh, the weight and uh, we'll go through the setup process and some recommendations um, about the uh, the cable and how to set that up properly and everything so as you can see on my uh, preamp here I've got um, you'll find the, the two RCA's now you'll notice that there's also a second uh, it's a grounding cable and uh, what I did was I did the uh, the recommended mod modification by Thorns themselves and uh, what they do is they put an additional grounding cable. The original turntable did not have a grounding cable because it was uh, uh, grounded to the chassis through the right channel which is the red which is the red RCA. So what I've done is I've put the uh, the grounding strap on and it's grounded into the uh, the chassis of the belt of the the table. Um, but it's sort of uh, mixed and whether you use this on the grounding post on the preamp or you just go with the two RCAs without the grounding cable. And the way you do that is by trial and error. So when you get the table, you plug it in. What I would suggest is plugging in the RCA jacks into your phono input on your uh, amplifier and try it first without putting the grounding cable on. And uh, if you notice it's clean and quiet and there's no uh, noticeable hum, then uh, that's what you go with. And then I would try it with the grounding cable on and if there's more noticeable hum, then basically uh, lose the grounding cable. But if it does sound quieter and sounds better with less hum, then obviously go with the grounding cable. So you have two options. And uh, so that's what I'm going to suggest. So I would try it without first and uh, if, if you are getting some hum, and it, it could be because of a ground loop with your particular unit, um, that's your other option is to, uh, to use the grounding cable. So, either or. And what I'll do is I'll strip this thing down and I'll show you basically how you will receive it. Um, and then I'll go through the, uh, the assembly instructions and show you how to balance the arm and properly set the Q-up lever. And uh, so I'll go through that sort of step by step and uh, hopefully um, it'll save you some angst and, and uh, problems when you receive your table. So stand by and we'll jump right to it. So this might, be, uh, might turn out to be a long boring video. I apologize for that but I think you might appreciate it when it comes time to uh, do your setup. So. The turntable you should re receive something similar to this, only you'll see a lot more tape around here. I'm only using this as a, a demonstration. So what I'm using is frog tape, and frog tape is uh, known, it's masking tape, uh, best known for not leaving residue behind. So what I'll do is I'll have a bunch of tapes around here to tape in the, uh, the inner platter. Uh, why that's important during transport is the inner pla platter is actually where the uh, where the uh, post sits inside the bearing and the bearing is probably the most delicate and probably the most engineered part of this whole table and what really makes a thorns table um, so good um, are these bearings so the TD-165 is like the TD-160 um, but it actually came in with, came with uh, two different uh, sized post and bearings so the less desirable ones are the seven millimeter um, bearings, and this one is the more desirable one because it's got the same bearing as the uh, TD160. So it's a uh, much wider bearing, and uh, basically it's filled with with oil. You've got a little uh, post that rides on a little ball bearing kind of uh, setup in the uh, the bottom. It's actually I think it's just kind of a, a 
conical uh, steel shaft kind of thing. Uh, vice a ball bearing that sits in a, like a pivot hole kind of thing, but it's very similar. Um, so what you're going to do here is uh, obviously peel this back very carefully so you don't leave residue. And if you do, you can always use a bit of alcohol or whatever to uh, coax the... Uh, so you'll see that this it's sticky, but it doesn't leave residue, which is so good. You don't want to be mucking up your uh, top plate or whatever. So I'm going to pull the bearing here, pull the uh, inner spindle, uh, and carefully, being careful not to uh, get oil all over the place because there is a bit of a bath of oil in it. But you'll find that uh, there's actually, when you pull it, there's a lot of suction. That's how finely engineered this bearing is. So I'm actually trying to break the suction. There, it just released. So you'll find it's difficult to pull and you just pull straight up. You don't want to torque it and, and obviously um, put, so there's your, your conical uh, point on the 10 millimeter bearing shaft. And inside there is your well and the bearing. And I believe there's a little ball bearing at the bottom. I'm not sure if it's seated or whether it will come out. So again, if I let it sit, you'll see that it rides up and it very, 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 very slowly pushes the oil out of the way and lets a little gulps of air in and it'll slowly seat down. So you gotta give it some time to actually get fully seated and then that's where you see how good the bearing is. So you just start it rotating and you'll see that it'll just rotate and rotate and rotate. Obviously friction will will take its toll and it'll, it'll stop, but, uh, but you'll see that it's very, very smooth um, bearing assembly and, uh, and it spins very, very uh, well. So um, that's how you're going to get it. And also when you receive it and before you untape the, uh, the inner spindle or inner platter just like I did, um, what you're going to do, and I'm going to send you another video and it's by Dave from Vinyl Nirvana showing exactly how to set up a TD-165 and for the most part you're going to follow that. And you'll notice here that if I push hard, you'll see that the spring assembly, because you usually have the weight of the platter and a whole bunch of other stuff, and this is tuned to also accompany the weight of the uh, of this uh, uh, counterweight here, basically, to uh, give it more rotational um, accuracy, and as well as provide a leveling bubble. So, um, it, it gives it more inertia, actually. So, um, before you untape this and everything, what you're going to do is you're going to flip the turntable up and in Dave's video you'll see the two screws. It's the two largest holes that are on the bottom of the, uh, the base plate. And uh, what this will, instead of being able to move like this, it'll be completely locked down with, uh, with two screws and some springs. And what you're going to do is you're going to release those screws so that you will allow the uh, suspension to start working on the... Uh, the platter. What we do is we cinch it down for transport so you don't wreck the suspension um, so it doesn't get all beat up while it's in uh, in transit and getting thrown around in shipping. So first thing you're going to do release those two, uh, two, two uh, locking screws to, that lock down the suspension then you're going to undo the tape and allow this to free wheel and then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to take your belt. Now this is the this one will be in the box as well, and this is a well-used one, and so what I did was I actually ordered one, and it's going to be inside the box in a little baggie, which I don't happen to have handy right now, but uh, it will be in the box. So basically what it does is it just goes around the bottom, so in 33, basically, you have a spindle here, you've got an upper spindle and a lower um, spindle, and for 33, Basically, the belt plays on the lower spindle and goes around the inner platter. So as you see, it starts to spin up. You can't really see it rotating because it's so smooth, but it, it is rotating. So there it is on 33. As you see, the th speed is at 33, so it's on the lower. This little unit here is engaged on the lower uh, spindle. And then when I change it to s zero, which is stop, of course, everything at the motor stops. And then I'm going to switch it over to 45, and you'll notice that this pulls the, the, the belt 
all the way to the top side of the spindle, which will ride higher up on the, uh, the inner platter. So that's for playing 45 LPs. So to go back to 33, obviously it drops back down and will go to zero. So now make sure it's in stop. And what we're going to do is we're going to put the belt on. Normally this is a two-hand procedure, but I'm just doing it with one just so I can film and talk at the same time. So this is not going to be pretty. So what you want to make sure when you get it on is A, that it goes around the spindle, and also that there's no twists in the belt at all. So if you go around once, you take all the twists, and then also make sure it rides in the middle. So because there's no weight on this right now, um, you might find that if you try to rotate it, it might slip off, slip on the upside, on the up, uh, slip down or slip up off the, uh, the spindle. So what you should do is rotate it, um, only or start the the motor only when you have the uh, the outer platter on because it adds a substantial amount of weight on it as well as your belt or sorry your uh, your uh, rubber mat that you see there so here's your rubber mat oh and I've also got this really tiny tiny weight no we'll explain that in a second so I don't want to lose that so once again make sure no twists and there, see, is because there's no weight on it, the belt is riding right at the very bottom. Not ideal. When there's more weight on it, it'll sink the suspension and it'll actually ride more in the middle. But it still works. So the other thing is, um, on the tone arm here, we've got, I've got, I've just got them just on just to show you where they'll be. Uh, I didn't want to make it too difficult to undo with one hand. But basically you're going to have two bread ties. One will be on the, uh, the arm uh, carrier and then the other will be on the Q lever. And basically what that does is that hard seats the, uh, the tone arm um, so that there's no play. Once that's locked down you'll find that there's no play and it won't uh, affect the bearings. So you're not actually putting stress on the bearings in here. Again, that's another uh, um, very good aspect of these types of turntables are the uh, the tone arm bearings are just absolutely spectacular. And then of course you've got your um, anti-skating hangers and we'll go into that in a second and this is where your counterweight will go on. So what we're going to do is we'll take those take those off so you no longer need those for uh, so that's just to seat the uh, tone arm so it doesn't get bashed around during transit. And you're going to set those aside, and you probably won't need those again until you move the turntable uh, a substantial distance again. So, um, the other thing is, um, I've left the head shell on, just because these things can be finicky to set. And what I recommend you get is a little uh, spirit level. And what you want to do... In this case, this is the perfect size. You'll note that the spirit level actually shows... Let's get this thing into focus. There we go. The spirit level actually shows that the uh, head shell is not actually truly horizontal, which is what you want to have it horizontal so it doesn't... So the stylus doesn't ride to one channel or the other channel. You want to have it dead in the middle, and that way your stylus is riding the groove perfect, perfectly perpendicular and you're not going to get any left channel or right channel uh, being emphasized over the other. So what you want to do is you just torque it a little bit and you'll get it. You might have to undo this a little bit. And then you adjust it. And this is something I could do now, but it'll be out of sync by the time it gets there. So again, there you go. It's right in the middle. Uh, depending on what angle you're looking at. And again, I'm doing this at one-handed. But from parallax in the video, it looks like it's a little off, but from my eyeball and looking dead on top, it's dead in the middle. So anyway, um, that's what you want to do is to make sure your, your head shell is perfectly um, horizontal to the floor, basically. 
and then that way your new needle is going to ride the groove perfectly perpendicular in the uh, the groove. Dead easy. The other thing is in this I've got the the cartridge in there so that's the M97XE cartridge but what I'll do is I'll have the stylus and there's a stylus guard that you'll see on this thing just to protect it so you don't actually knock the stylus about or whatever and what we're going to do is you're going to pop that into it. There's a little uh, diamond shaped channel that's inside the uh, I'm going to have to oh it's further down. There we go. There we go. I'm trying to do everything one handed. So diamond shaped channel you're going to feed that in to make sure that the stylus is home. And then the other uh, thing, then you can pop the guard, but we're going to leave the guard down now because we're going to be doing some balancing and balancing the tone arm. And just in case you accidentally drop it, you don't want to trash your uh, the stylus on the end of the cantilever, and that would be bad. So, uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift it up for one second just to show you something. So there is this uh, device that came... That I got for thorns and this comes with my turntable upstairs and what it is it's a little template and instead of having to go through and using a, um, a protractor on the uh, on the platter and getting your perfect angle and and nodal points for the uh, for the stylus they came up with this little um, I don't know what you'd call it some sort of a shiv or something. Um, anyway, you pop it on and the idea is once it's fully seated there's a little uh, triangular groove there and your stylus should be right at the tip of that groove and once it's there um, your stylus is dead on for your uh, pivot point to stylus and your nodal points and uh, and all of your um, angular settings for the arm. And the other thing is you have to make sure your uh, cartridge is actually properly aligned inside the, uh, in the, inside the head shell. I've done all that for you. That's why, uh, but really all you need is the, if you ever need to do it yourself, you don't really need this. All you need is the distance from the end plate here to the tip of the stylus and you can actually do it with a ruler and just uh, eyeball it and get it right. So, and then there, there's other protractors that you can get from uh, um, Vinyl Engine online and stuff to actually do it the, uh, the old-fashioned way, which actually many, propon many people basically um, say that that's what you should do anyway. So, I'm going to take a break here. My hands are getting a little bit shaky, and we'll carry on. All right, this is take two on trying to... Uh, show you how to properly balance the tone arm. So I thought I'd record it. I guess I probably was talking to myself for the better part of about 15 minutes on how to properly balance the tone arm and uh, I'm finding I didn't actually record it. So here's take two. So with the, uh, I like to uh, set up the, um, the tone arm without the outer um, spindle on the uh, outer platter on the uh, the tone arm just because you got more room to work with in here um, so basically as you get it um, this will have been locked down locked down here with the the bread ties you undo those and uh, we went through the balancing part of the uh, the head shell to make sure that's properly properly horizontal to the uh, to the uh, record and uh, so you'll also get this counterweight and of the counterweight we take off because we don't want to have too much pressure on the uh, the really high quality bearings that are in the uh, the tone arm and you'll see that there's two little nipples here on the uh, where the counterweight goes and basically when you put the uh, the counterweight on um, you can rotate and rotate until you've actually engaged those nipples it won't start moving the uh, counterweight forward or backwards uh, but before I put that on, I should explain the, uh, the counterweight. It's a two-piece unit. Basically, um, you've got the, the massive part, which is the weight itself, and then you've got the calibrated scale on the uh, front. And what that does is that rotates, 
Um, so I should probably put a little bit of oil on it or something like that, but I don't want to mess with it and get it all gunked up. So it, it, it works the way it is. It's just a, a little bit more friction than you normally have to apply to these. So basically, um, the weight moves forward and aft on the, uh, the shaft here. And basically what you want to do is be able to neutrally balance the, uh, the whole arm. And to do that, uh, you move the weight forward and aft until you get to the point where the, the arm is, is completely in balance. And then what you want to do is you want to move the scale without moving the weight. So you can actually hold the weight and rotate this so that it lines up with this little black line that you can barely see right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to put it on, engage the little nipples on there, and now you can see that the, uh, the weight is starting to move forward. But once you get to uh, a point where it's in balance, it won't necessarily read zero on the scale. So what you do is you move the, without moving the weight, you move the black scale so it lines up with zero once you've got it balanced. And then that allows you to, uh, then it's now calibrated for dialing in the weight. And each whole number, so you got one, two, three, and then back to zero, which would be four again, if you went one full rotation. That's measured in grams. So the stylus weight, the recommended stylus force for this particular cartridge is 1.5 grams. So what we're going to do when we do this is make sure that the stylus guard is down. So if we accidentally drop it on the tabletop, um, we don't actually damage the cantilever or the stylus on the, uh, the cartridge, because that could be very expensive if you had to replace a bunch of those. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to disengage the, the head shell from the, uh, the stowage place. And you can see right away, as soon as I moved it, boom, the arm went straight up. So obviously the counterweight is too far back. So if we start dialing it in, and again, you see that uh, that's why we have the stylus uh, guard on. And we're going to keep moving the weight forward until the arm starts to settle down. Now that's heavy. And what we're going to do also, so you can see how it's up in the air, we're going to lower the Q lever so it's not in the way. Ugh, I'm trying to do this one-handed is just not ideal. Anyway, let's move it forward a bit. Okay, now that's heavy. You can see it's totally depressed onto the Q, ar Q arm here, the Q lead, um, yeah, the Q arm. So we're going to dial it back. And when it's in balance, it should be just about horizontal with where the stowage area is. So we're going to just keep dialing this weight. See, now it's starting to rise up a bit, but that's a little too light now. Dial it forward a bit. And there we go. You can now see that the tone arm is in balance. So if I apply a little bit of force on it downward, it'll come back to balance. And if I go up, it'll come back down. And now we found the actual balance. So ideally you want this to read zero, but as you see the scale here shows that the black lever there, the black uh, scale reads three. So what you can do is you can rotate that scale. Let's lock this down. So we've locked it back down so we can move this. I'm going to have to, uh, it's kind of hard to do it one handed. So if you hold this and then you move this, notice the weight isn't moving. And the black, when you, when you dial in the black, it doesn't actually adjust the uh, counterweight forward or aft. So what you're going to do is you're going to dial it so that the zero mark is read right on that little line there. And you're going to have to go back and forth a little bit and make sure that it's in balance. So there you go. It's a little heavy because I think doing it one-handed I spun the weight a little bit too much. Let's go back a bit. There we go. So 
goes out by about a half a gram just by not doing it two-handed. You can see why you want to have that platter off just so you have a little bit of space. There we go. So there it's balanced and it's almost there. So it's balanced. So I'm just going to move that zero mark and then now we've got zero balance, zero in the scale and the tone arm is completely in balance. Almost in balance. Just adjusting it. It's way heavy there. There we go. It's reading zero on the scale, and it's reading, and the arm is in balance. So, now what we're going to do is we're going to seat this thing home, and on the scale, the recommended tracking force is 1.5 grams, but remember we were talking about this little brush that's on the front end here. Actually, we weren't. Uh, that's part of the re recording that went missing. So on this stylus guard, there's a little brush, and there's two schools of thought. One school of thought is remove the guard and remove the brush because it's applying extra force to the, uh, the record. But the, uh, I think the advantages outweigh the disadvantages in that uh, that little brush is made out of carbon fiber, and what it does is it statically neutralizes the, uh, the platter, so it prevents ticks and pops. And it also pre-cleans the grooves before the, the stylus actually gets to, the, uh, gets to that part of the record. So um, you can take this guard off if you want. Some people do that. Uh, I don't. Just because it uh, has some anti-static properties that uh, prevent ticks and pops. And uh, I happen to like that a lot better. So the recommended stylus tracking force is 1.5 grams. However, with that brush... You have to add another quarter of a gram, so you should be setting at 1.75. So, with this scale at zero, now that we've got this anchored, we're going to dial on. Now we're going to move the silver part, which moves the weight forward and aft, instead of the black part. And we're going to dial in, and we're going clockwise. Right C, tight C, left C, loose C, so it's right C. Uh, so that's one gram. We're going to go to just between 1.5 and 2, and that's 1.75 grams. And now we have the appropriate uh, tracking force of 1.5 grams on the stylus plus the 2.25 grams that are uh, taken up by the, uh, the mass or the ex extra drag of the, uh, the carbon fiber brush on the, uh, the stylus guard. And that is how you basically balance the tone arm. So once you put the, once you put the ex, external platter on, so what we'll do is we'll lift the cue lever so that holds up the stylus. And now you drop it. And of course it's not going to go all the way because this doesn't sink all the way, but it, it will go far enough down that it will now be playing on the record once the, uh, the external... Um, secondary uh, platter uh, is on. So uh, there we have it. It's pretty accurate and then of course I go into this uh, diatribe about uh, digital meters, uh, weigh scales that we have there and you can actually confirm the weight of uh, what you have dialed on but I find that uh, this scaling is quite accurate. So. That is how we do the, uh, the balancing of the tone arm. Uh, if you have any questions, give me a call. Um, I can walk you through it. It's not that hard. There's lots of videos on YouTube that explains how to do it as well. So onward and upward. So in the uh, Vinyl Nirvana video that I sent uh, with Dave sit talking you through the setup, he actually doesn't go through all of this nose of setting a zero and the calibrated wheel that's on the, uh, the counterbalance and all that stuff. 
he actually uses a uh, it's like a teeter totter style uh, sure cartridge um, w um, balance I guess you'd call it to get to his 1.5 grams or whatever uh, st tracking force his particular cartridge was um, and that's one way of doing it you can use these uh, mechanical balance kind of weights that you, you can get at a hi-fi shop they tend to be really pricey what I did was I went and got one of these off of uh, eBay I think from J China and what it is is a, a digital calibrated mirror so if you don't trust the scale on here um, I actually find it to be very accurate it's um, I you know I've been using this digital meter and it measures you can set it to measuring grams so um, it's kind of too bright so you can see how I'm applying force to the pad here and it's very very accurate and you can get these things for I think 15 bucks or 12 bucks from China or whatever and they work really really good so that's one option where you can get the sure um, counterbalance kind of uh, teeter-totter way scale type thing so if you don't trust the scale you don't really need it these are pretty damn accurate so, uh, but if if you want to go to the nth degree, then you can go to these uh, these kind of uh, weigh scales. So this one was smart weight. But the thing you want to do is um, what I do is I don't put this because of the thickness of this weight weigh scale. You can see it has thickness. You don't put that on top of the platter. You want to make sure the scale is at the same height as the uh, the record surface. So I usually have a couple little blocks that are measured to the size that I just lay it off to the side in, in a place where when you drop the stylus it can actually drop onto the pad and give me a weight that's equivalent to the same level as the, uh, the surface of the, of the record that you're playing. Otherwise if it's too high um, there will be you know, uh, inaccuracies as to the, uh, the weight that you're actually the applied measured force. It's a little bit of trigonometry there. Anyway, um, that's probably going too too deep into it all. So um, that one, it's mine, unfortunately. Uh, but you, like I say, you can get them cheap. But I will throw that in, so at least you got something to use. And I was throwing a record when I uh, sent off a turntable, so you'll have a record to play when you get to the when it gets to the other end. Um, the other thing um, that I had to build up. Uh, because there's a cheap plastic 45 adapter that came with the 165 and they're chintzy so what I ended up doing was uh, I got this adapter it was actually part of my uh, squeaky clean kit over there and what I did was I put these little spacers on it and what I did was uh, wrapped it obviously the same way as uh, the turntable and basically you want to put that into that well where the 45 adapter goes because otherwise what will happen is your your platter mat can slide off and and uh, not be centered properly and also something for your record to uh, sit on so it doesn't actually not that it would actually bend in but anyway it just makes everything smooth and flush so uh, with that said once you've got the arm all balanced off then you can pick up your platter and these holes what you want to do is I got it I've put a little bit I'll put a little more elbow grease before I pack it in because these things can get pretty gunked up and what I use is I use mother's um, sorry for the mess here that I've been tinkering as you can see mother's mag and aluminum polish and what I do is I get uh, some really really good uh, fine um, paper towel you don't want stuff that leaves fibers all over the place and then what you do is you gunk up the edge and give her a good little bit of elbow grease and I'll do that a little bit before I uh, send it off because these things are uh, I can't remember it's n not nickel some sort of weird uh, alloy basically and they keep a shine for quite a while but as soon as you put your fingers and get your fingers on it then it just dulls right up so some people what they do is they'll polish it up and then put some preservative on it uh, me I just go with the mothers and polish it up every every once in a while and try not to handle the outside edge of the uh, the platter I mean, the one I have upstairs it took me hours and hours of elbow grease to get it to a mirror finish but uh, it's well worth it when uh, when you have somebody come over and they say wow look at how great that looks but again 
I'll, uh, I'll give it a give it a rip, and uh, it won't be perfect, but uh, that's something you can work on. And it, you know, it's just cosmetic. So, so, so use the holes to uh, put the weight on. This thing is really, really heavy. Um, it's it when you set it on to the inner platter, you'll notice that it actually sinks in quite a bit, and then you'll see the uh, suspension start to engage and start to to bounce and and get to that point where it's uh, you know a finely tuned machine. So let's uh, put it on. Again, this is a two-handed job because these finger holes are far apart. So I'm going to put them on and put, put it on and then I'll resume filming. As soon as you put the platter on, like I mentioned, it does sink in a bit and you start to see the bound, you know, start to see it start to suspend. Now it's not quite there yet because you don't have all the weight that you're supposed to have on it yet. And you have this rubberized platter. So here we've got uh, also two manuals. One is the uh, the owner's manual in three languages. And then the other one in English only is the, I think it's English only, is the service manual. And the service manual is actually for a whole host of different uh, turntables, of which you have the 165 and 160 Series 1. Yours is a Series 1. So you just go to the chapters and the diagrams that pertain to your particular model and you have all the diagrams about the electronic boards and the arm and parts and pieces and all that sort of stuff but the main one you want to use is the user manual so we'll put the uh, get the dust all over everywhere so you put that on and again you see how you've got that for the old-fashioned cheap chintzy 45 adapter um, Get that hole so that's again why that spacer is stuck up and uh, that's why you have those little pads on the bottom just to make it flush so you don't have this thing sliding all over the place and again a little more bouncier yet and remember that what I did was I uh, I basically balanced the spring suspension system to account for the centrifugal weight that uh, that we also put on the record to keep the record from bowing and also to do a quick check to see that um, that your uh, platter and your table is centered. Uh, I just remembered something. Uh, one thing you also want to do is when you take it off, take the, uh, the turntable out of the box, I have these um, conical feet that are on it and there's these little puck shaped items that uh, you can see right there and they've got a little hole in it and basically what you're going to do is you're going to make sure that uh, where your turntable is going that the uh, the cone so the point of the cone on the fo foot actually sits in the little hole there and these things are adjustable so if your turntable isn't uh, I'm going to adjust it there. There we go. It's seated home. So if you find that uh, the turntable isn't completely flat in both directions, and, it, and once again, use your spirit level. Um, you've got the one that's on the uh, centrifugal weight, or press, or whatever you want to call it. But you can also do a quick check with your spirit level bubble, and you can see whether it's forward or aft, and... and uh, these things are adjustable by about a half an inch, so you can actually adjust each of the individual legs to get your arm, your uh, your um, turntable perfectly balanced. And there you have it. So uh, next we have so now we've got the arm centered and weighted properly. Now there's another component of a tone arm which. Uh, is caused by the centrifugal action of the, uh, the the record spinning around and what it is is the tendency if you didn't have a, a force or a lateral force applied to the tone arm when you put the record on it will tend to want to slide towards the middle because of the centrifugal force of the grooves acting on the needle and and pulling it towards the the middle that's called a skating force so with this turntable unlike other turntables and more modern turntables uh, instead of using a magnetic anti-skating uh, method of applying lateral force to the arm 
they actually use, and I, I think this is more accurate than the, uh, the magnetic ones, is they use a little hanging weight, and it's a very super fine, super, super fine um, wire thread, I guess it is. Or it might even be just like a fishing line or whatever. And at the very end of that wire is a little loop. And then you're going to see on this, on the anti-skating hangers that I mentioned earlier, there are little grooves. And their grooves are numbered from the um, pivot point side. One, two, three, four, five, six. So if we go to our user manual, that's where I had it open, but I kind of closed it when I was showing you the manuals. What I did was I highlighted the settings. Uh, I'm gonna make, oh, there we go. So there's a little table here. And you've got the small weight, which is the one that's there. That's the only one that came with the turntable. And there's also a heavier weight. You can actually add a little uh, nut or something, but you don't actually need the heavy weight, which is the small weight plus an additional collar that hangs on it. Um, because the, the tracking forces for this particular cartridge are too high, um, you don't actually use the heavy weight. You use the light weight, um, which is the one that's which is there. So back in the old days, they used to have a thing called playing wet records. You used to you know, uh, spray down your record and play it wet, which caused a little bit of difference in the uh, the anti-skating force. But so what we're using here is dry because nobody does wet records anymore. Um, small weight, uh, the stylus force. We've applied 1.5 grams to the stylus. Remember, you got the 0.25 for the brush, but we're going by the stylus, and we're talking a dry cartridge. So we're playing the records dry, not soaked in water. And there it says six. So what that means is with this counterweight or this uh, anti-skating weight, you're going to hang this. And I don't know if I can do this one handed. I should be able to. So you see that loop? You're going to hang it. You're going to take the loop and put it over that hanger. It's going to hurt that I... Oh, that my glasses are dirty. Okay, so you see it says six there, and we're going to hang the weight right there. And you can see it's at the very end notch on both of them. So it's six and six. And that is your proper, your proper position for an anti-skating force of 1.5 grams to, to compensate for the 1.5 grams of downward force that's on your stylus and your head shell or your whole basically stylus pressure point. So having done that, you're now set up basically to play. Um, there's nothing else that I can think of other than some other maintenance stuff that I'll include. And if you get, you know, after a couple of years, you want to change out your, uh, your oil inside the... Uh, the bearing well there and you can use these uh, special q-tips don't use regular ones because what they do is they, they they shed fibers and fibers inside of a very highly polished um, um, bearing well or a bearing because of the tight tolerances remember how much pressure back pressure was uh, exerted by it um, you use these to basically clean it out so you don't leave any fibers behind throw them out once they're all gun gungy and dirty and then you're going to put fresh oil in it and do that every few years. It doesn't need to, uh, like this one when I got it, it was it was quite dirty. I mean, the, the guy had been sitting for quite a few years and uh, it had gotten all gunky and everything. So we cleaned it all out real nice. Notice that there's no play in the bearing, which is really good. And uh, we've got, I think the bearing is just like new. So I think you'll be satisfied. And another test of it, right now the belt's on, so it'll it'll resist a bit but it'll play so if we turn the turn the platter on and then just let it spin you'll see it spins and spins but the true way of doing it is take the belt off because it's actually resistance on the belt that causes us to stop you'll 
If you take the belt off, you spin it, you'll find it'll just spin and spin and spin. So uh, very, very little uh, friction, basically, in that bearing. So the next item we're going to discuss is the uh, the Q-up lever, which goes into this little holder right here that's uh, double-sided taped to the uh, top plate on the turntable. And uh, that's something you have to sort of play with to get the position just right. And what it is, is a uh, it's an automatic tone arm lifter. So this particular turntable is a, what we call a fully manual turntable. That is, it has no automated um, linkages in the tone arm assembly to move the cartridge or the, the head shell over to the lead-in of the record, drop it, and then play the record, and then subsequently, um, when it finishes, lift the arm and move it back home. That's typically what we call an automatic turntable, or a semi-automatic turntable is one where you manually move it over with a cue lever or whatever, drop it onto the uh, drop it onto the uh, record, plays the record out, and then automatically lifts the tone arm and then takes it back home. That's called a semi-automatic turntable. This one is completely manual, so when you play your record, you manually move it over, once it plays out, it goes and plays in the out groove, and until you actually manually remove the stylus off the record, or lift the stylus off the record, it will continue to play in that out groove indefinitely until you wear out your needle, which is a bad thing. So if you fall asleep while you're listening to a record, um, wake up in the morning, you're, you'll find that your record has been playing for six or seven or eight hours um, and wearing out your needle prematurely. So, uh, this little Canadian invented device is called a Q-Up Lever, and really handy device. So what it does is it slides into this little assembly right here, and what you want to do is have this armature, and the way it works is, I should probably show you how it works first, so you've got this little arm assembly here, you've got a hair trigger um, switch on the top, so there's the tone arm moves across the record and then when it comes to the play out of the record it basically hits the super sensitive switch and in turn fires it's a trigger more or less and it lifts the arm off of the record there's a couple of uh, adjustments that can be made on this thing there's a sliding uh, control on the back and a sliding control that you can see on the front here the one on the back actually determines how violently this lifts up. So if it's uh, bouncing your tone arm too much, you can actually adjust this by sliding it up. I think is desensitizing it, sliding it down actually makes it more violent. And on the front control is basically adjusting how sensitive this hair trigger switch is. And uh, so you can make it less sensitive, more sensitive, I think I've got it right balanced perfectly, but if you find that it's not firing after it's depressing it, then you would adjust this. So I think it's perfectly set for that one. But uh, this one you might have to play with it. And it depends also on the height relative to the arm that it is. So there is an ideal height, so you got to play around with it. Once you've got it set though, you don't have to mess with it. So the way I've got it sort of adjusted is the front part here. There's two little raised rails on the uh, the bottom of this and they coincide with rails that are uh, etched into the uh, the holder there and you can move it up move it down and you want it just so it's just below the arm when the arm is actually resting on the when the needle is resting on the player so that it's not interfering with the arm as it tracks across the record so we'll play with that and then what I've done is where it's on you know the front edge of this if you match it up to the front edge of the holder you're just about there you might have to play with it forward or backward just to get it to the right place so when it plays out that it triggers every time and again you'll have to you'll have to play with that and the odd label sometimes the labels are too big and that might mess it up but if it's a standard size label it'll work 99.9% .9 of the time so uh, now that we've got it set what we're going to do is we're going to lift the record, we're going to start the record player up, so we're in 33, it's a 33 RPM. So we're going to move the stylus over and you notice that it's not interfering with the arm and the arm is actually well, or the 
the arm of the cue-up lever is well below the arm of the turntable. It might be actually too low to where it is, and then you can see where it trips up. So, uh, we're going to reset it. I've got it on cue. So we'll hopefully get it to the point where it'll be just playing out when I drop the record, drop the stylus onto it with the cue lever. And there it plays out. Oh, not quite there. So what we're going to do is we've lifted the arm, we're going to move it back over, and we're going to bump it ahead a little bit. And go back and try it again. Oop, I went too far. Shaky hands. Let's try that again. Again, drop the stylus, let it play out. And, oh, not quite again. One more, and then we should be good. There we go, we're going to drop the stylus, and it's going to go over, and boom, up it goes. So you notice how it jumped up a lot, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower it one notch, and then it should be uh, less violent when it lifts it off the, uh, off the turntable. So what I'm going to do is pause it here and then uh, lower it by one notch, and then we should be right there. it by one notch and we're going to drop it you can hear it playing out there you go less violent and it's lifted the, the needle off the record and the turntable will continue to spin until you turn it off however you're now saving wear and tear on your stylus. So that is the Q-Up lever. It'll be in, a, in this box inside the, uh, the kit as well. So you'll have to play with it once you get to it. There's lots of videos online that show you how to set it up and everything. And the website itself. Just type Q-Up lever. Tone arm lifter. Q-Up tone arm lifter on uh, Google. And, and you can see lots of videos on how to do it.